All right. Well, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a session about uh, Records Management 2.0. My name is Kevin Dorr. I'm the uh, Solutions Engineer for the America's Partner Channel, which means that uh, I help out partners to do pre-sales. Are there any partners in the room? I don't really see any. You guys all records managers. So are there actually some records managers in the room? Anybody records manager? No? Um, okay. Has anybody used records management 2.0? Okay. Well, cool. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go through just kind of a brief history of records management so that you know what it's about. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the features in the new records management. And uh, after that, I'll do a brief demo of uh, the new RM so that you can see what it looks like. So are there some people that are running RM1? No? Yes? OK. All right, good. All right. So let's start off with a, a short history of records management. So. This is a rendering of what they think the library in Alexandria might have looked like in ancient Egypt. So um, they say at one time, before uh, probably about 500 years before Christ, this might have held all of the world's knowledge. And so records have been important to people for quite a long time. But the un unfortunate thing about the library at Alexandria is that uh, they say that when Julius Caesar invaded Egypt that uh, he set a bunch of ships on fire and the fire spread to the library and it burned it all down. So darned if uh, all of the knowledge of the world went along with it. So um, that's why you use records management so that you can keep control of uh, your important stuff. So um, a little bit later on in history after that, then records were managed like this where you had to copy them by hand and that was uh, a bit tedious and painful. So that's not really an easy way to do things, and it's really not particularly a fun thing to do either. So forward into history, now we have electronic computers that we can use to do records management. So what do you do with a records management system? Well, um, for one thing, you might want to keep track of important business records that uh, you have that you want to track over time. So. For example, in the pharmaceutical industry, you might just want to keep track of different batches or that type of thing that uh, you've done for experiments. And uh, sometimes uh, you want to keep track of other important things that you've used to base business decisions on. So it's an archiving kind of thing. In addition, sometimes you need to prove that you've complied with uh, government regulations or standards that are imposed upon you by someone else. So that's an important thing to hold records so that you can, if somebody comes to you and says, well, we need to know that you were in compliance with a particular record at a particular time, that you can look that up in your, your records database and actually prove to people that at that time you were in compliance. Finally, there's uh, our friends, the lawyers, and often they sue people. So when that happens, you need to be able to look through your records and find uh, the records that the lawyers are trying to get out of your corporation. So the, uh, that's often called e-discovery. And uh, so in that case, hello, Jerome. Um, in that case, you need to um, be able to freeze the records so that nobody has access to them at all. And uh, that's an important feature of a records management system as well. So. How did Alfresco get into the records management business? Well, back in uh, 2005, we started up and uh, we came out with sort of a core set of functionality. We had our document management product and uh, then we had some other things that we added on over time. But our, our primary business was to manage documents and manage content. So records management is actually a really natural extension of that because we already have content and we have controls over it. So if you build some additional stuff sort of on top of that, then you can actually manage records. So what happened was is that in 2009, John Newton, who was our uh, CTO, who you saw talk yesterday morning, actually wrote the records management application by himself. And he did that so that it was compliant with this standard here, the Department of Defense 5051. So that's a particular way of storing records that is important to the US Department of Defense. 
Now the thing about that is, is that the records are stored in a very particular way in the standard. There's three levels of a hierarchy. And uh, the way that this implementation was written, that was all you could do with it. You had to use the three levels of the hierarchy. And if you had a different hierarchy, you couldn't really implement that with our old records management product. So um, some people told us, well, that's kind of a drag. We'd really like you to fix that. So my friend over here, uh, Roy Weatherall, has pretty much fully refactored all of the code so that now you can store records in a larger hierarchy and you can specify um, how, the, uh, how they're used. So that's a new product that just came out over the summer. Um, it was released in uh, August, in fact. And uh, we're very excited about that product because it's, in, in addition to being very flexible in terms of how you store records, it also has, under the covers, uh, pretty much implemented, re-implemented how things work so that it's much more like the rest of the, the document management system. So you can extend it in the ways that you can extend the document management system. So um, the new records management system, like I said, it has multi-level folder support, and I'll talk about more about what that means in a minute. Um, and how many people here went to Roy's talk yesterday about 2.1? A couple of people, okay. So I'll go over some of what he said too, or I'll, maybe I'll let him go over what he said. Um, so there's, there's another effort to actually build uh, a point release now, 2.1, which uh, I guess will be available in the spring. And uh, there's a whole bunch more additional great functionality that's going to be in that release, including, as uh, you heard uh, John allude yesterday, to in situ records management or in place records management. And what that means is that in the current version of the product, you actually have to move something into the control of the records management application. So you have to take it from wherever it is and move it into the records management site, which is kind of a hassle for everybody. So um, the new version will actually allow you to specify the record where it is, and it will migrate kind of into the site away from uh, the view of people that uh, are using it. But the, um, it actually is left there so that users can uh, still get at the, the record and uh, see it. And they don't have to understand how any of the records management stuff works, which is left to the esoteric records management people. So, um, but the really cool thing about Records Management 2.0 is that it's customizable. And so um, I'll talk some here about uh, different ways that you can do that. So uh, what we like to say about that is that it's easy and fun now. So let's uh, continue on to, uh, this is, some notes about uh, installation. I'll go through this pretty fast because this is just sort of a jumble of numbers. So um, the Records Management 2.0 product requires this version of Alfresco because there are some actually dependencies between the core repository and records management. So you have to have 4.02. Um, if you are trying to install it into the latest version of Alfresco, 4.1.1, there's a patch that you need to get and uh, that patch will actually be available with the 4.1.2 version. So um, there's a dependency on the search engine. The first version of RM didn't, RM2 rather, didn't support the solar indexing engine that we ship with our uh, version four of Alfresco now. So you have to use Lucene if you're using that particular version. However, the um, latest version that just came out last week on, uh, or I guess it was two weeks ago on Halloween, does support solar, so you can get that, and now you can also use uh, solar as an indexing engine. And if you're upgrading from version one to version two, that's pretty simple to do. So what you do is you take the records management AMP file, you apply it to the uh, Alfresco war file for four, and uh, you have to be sure that you're using the right versions and that type of thing. Um, and then you just uh, deploy the wars and then uh, everything will be uh, deployed for you. RM will actually take the, your existing content and it will convert it into the new format. Now, 
Remember when I talked about the three-layer hierarchy? The top layer of that hierarchy has gone away as an object in the uh, new implementation. That's called a record series. And the series are converted into kind of a, a uh, object that is uh, still around but doesn't really do anything. So you can see them, but they don't really play into how things work. So that all happens automatically for you. Well, so if you're going to try to do anything customizing-wise with uh, records management, how do I know what's in the package? Well, so RM is shipped as two different AMP files. Does everybody understand what an AMP file is? Okay. So um, there's one for share, and then there's one for the repository. So you can take those and sort of decompile them to see what's inside of them. So uh, an AMP file is just a zip file, right? So you can unzip it, and you'll see everything that's there. Now, the cool thing about that is that this um, actually contains a lot of interesting little things that you can use for other projects that you might be using um, Alfresco for. So um, you can use some of the RM code as a really good example of how to do things in terms of building a custom user interface, for example. The last talk that I gave uh, a short while ago, um, I was pointing this out because the, the way that the user interfaces are implemented in RM is based on our latest paradigm in terms of how to configure and how to use share um, from a module perspective and uh, contains the best practices that we would recommend for you to use to package a user interface and deploy it. Um, in addition, it's also got um, the DoD 5015 code in it as an example. So the, what's been changed basically is the DOD used to be the actual implementation of records management, but now it's been pulled out and now it's sort of like a separate module that you can configure RM for. So that works as a really good example of a way for you to set up how you want to store your records. And uh, I'll go through a little bit more about how that works in a, a couple of minutes too. Um, so here's what's in the AMP package for the repo. Like I said, there's, the, there's a couple of different data models. The first one is the new data model that's the refactored data model, and I'll talk about what's in there. And then the, the uh, DOD model as well. And then there's a, a whole bunch of different configuration files that uh, didn't used to be in the old product. So you can look through some of these configuration files and get a sense of how things are set up in the new uh, RM version, and you can see how you can actually change some of the configurations to do different things that you might want to do. The ShareAmp package has, um, like I said, it's a really good place to look for examples of how to actually build uh, <coughs> customized user interface pages. So it's um, got the template definitions, the page definitions, and then it's got uh, uh, different custom pages that uh, Actually, the document library one actually sort of appends on to the existing document library, so it's an interesting implementation as well. So I'd highly encourage, if you're, if you're thinking about actually trying to do any kind of customization or any kind of uh, custom configuration, to actually look into what's in the AMP files, because most of the core content that you can configure, I see Dix walked into the back, um, has, uh, is actually in the AMP files. All right, so let's talk some about the content model. So in the 2.0, there's two different ways to extend what data model or data uh, metadata that you attach to a record um, that you can do. So uh, the first way to do that <coughs> is you can do it dynamically through the management console, which is a feature that we had in version one, but it's been re-implemented in version two and now works um, in a more generalized way in terms of uh, attaching uh, elements to a custom model. But the cool thing now is you can also extend the content model itself. And uh, that gives you the ability to define a type of record. Um, and if you, I'll, I'll show you exactly how the DOD works. But uh, you can actually um, set up, does everybody understand what an aspect is? Okay. So you can set up an aspect that defines a specific set of metadata, and you can also give that a type 
that uh, you can attach to a record as you add it into the content store. So you can, you can grab that metadata, so you've got the whole set of metadata, plus it, it actually says this is like an employee record, for example. So that's a cool feature. And in addition to that, you could also, if you really wanted to go way off the deep end, is you could create a custom model based on some of the other objects that are in the content model. Um, since they're all concrete objects and you can extend those now, which was a lot harder to do with version one. So in terms of the dynamic metadata, this is what the page looks like, which is pretty similar to what the page looked like in version one. You can just come in here, you can say, uh, I'd like to define a new piece of metadata. But that applies horizontally across all of the records that are defined. So if I define that and I can attach it to one of these base types. So I can set a piece of metadata um, and attach it to a record and then that piece of metadata will show up in all the records. So that's one way to extend the content model. Um, so if we go to the actual definition of how the, the new RM content model is set up, there's a, a few classes of objects. There's a set of containers. Then there's a couple of things that actually define what records are for the system. And then there's some processing type of objects like uh, 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 file plans and that type of thing. And then there's also a custom content model, as I said. So this is what the container model looks like. Um, in, this, in these diagrams, the green objects are from the base um, document management content model. And the blue objects will be um, actual types. The gray things are little aspects that get uh, attached to those. So there's a root container that gets defined. And um, then as a subclass of the root container, there's a record category that can have a, what's called a vital record definition. So a vital record just says, is this a vital record or not? It's just a switch in there. And a vital record means it's something that's really important for you to keep around. Um, and then a file plan is a specialized type of container. That's basically the root of the tree. So you only get one of those in a, in a site. Categories can contain a disposition schedule. So a disposition schedule tells RM how to handle all of the content or all of the records that are present inside of the category. So, um, a, so that might uh, tell RM, keep this content for seven years and then destroy it and destroy it so that nobody can ever find it again, get it off of my disk. Um, or it might you know, be anything else that you want to tell it. The final element of the container model is this thing called a record folder. So categories can contain a folder, and folders are where you put records. So um, folders basically uh, have a, a couple of other different tricks to them that you can close them, which means that uh, you can't put any more content into them, and that's usually what you do right before you uh, pass it off to a disposition schedule that says hold this for a while and then do something to it. Oh, and finally, um, the record series object, which used to be in the content model, is now deprecated. There's still an object for it in the content model, but it's no longer really uh, used by the processing stuff. The record model now is composed of this. So, um, a record is defined with these types of attributes. Um, there's a few different uh, aspects assigned to it. And then there's these things, which are um, actually aspects. So if I wanted to find a new piece of content that's a, I want to define it as a record, the only thing that I have to do to define that as a record is to say that it inherits from this aspect here called record metadata. And the system understands that everything that's subclassed from that, it should treat as a record type. So um, that's a really cool and interesting feature and it's pretty easy to use. I'll show you how that works. Finally, there's a uh, separate piece of content here that's called a non-electronic component and we'll leverage this more in the future. 
as you can see, the non-electronic component is really to store things that are pieces of paper that are non-electronic, I guess. Um, so a lot of companies have existing records that are in filing cabinets or in boxes or someplace in a cave. And uh, this allows you to specify the location of those things so that you can still find them by doing searches in here. So um, that's another thing that we'll be working on in future versions to make that easier to uh, find and uh, do searches on. So why do you really care about this? Well, so like I said, you can now extend the content model. And uh, so you can subclass it just like um, any other content model that we have in the, the system now. So it works the same as the rest of the stuff. And uh, if you do that, you may need to actually modify some of the code to get it to work right. So that's a, a non-trivial thing to do, however. But the really cool thing is, is that the, if you define a new type, it gets pulled in by RM automatically. Like I said, it looks for the base class of record metadata, and that's what it uses to determine that there's a, a record type there. So that makes it easy to add new type definitions into RM. So to do that, you have to just bootstrap the model like you would normally bootstrap something in the uh, regular document management system and then add a form definition into uh, share so that the, the content shows up in the uh, metadata page. And that's exactly how the DOD model is defined, by the way. So this is what the DOD model looks like. So it, once again, it extends from record metadata. And these are the types that used to be in the version one system. So these are the types that are used by the the DOD model, so each one of these is defined as an aspect in the system. And if you go and look, there's a, like a subdirectory in the uh, repo part of the AMP that uh, has these definitions, so you can go and look in there and see how they work. So here's how it looks when you actually try to add a record. You get this, um, so if I go into a, a file um, folder in the RM system, and I say I want to add a file, um, or file a record, rather. Um, I'll get this pop-up menu, and you can see at the top there, if you look fairly closely, those are the DOD types. And so I can pick on one of those, and it assigns that type. So what it does under the covers is it assigns that aspect to that record. So that means that the system now understands that it is that type of record, and uh, it's uh, fairly easy to to work with that way. So that's a pretty cool feature. And then uh, once you get to the metadata page, and this is probably even harder to see, especially in the back, um, but this is a record that I defined as a PDF file, and this is the metadata that's defined there in the uh, uh, aspect. And so this is the form grouping that you would get from the uh, form definition for the metadata. Okay, so to summarize, um, once again, you just add the, you set up a type definition, and uh, I would use the, the ones that are there for the DOD to uh, uh, sort of guide you through how to do that. So here's what that looks like in code. So um, once again, you have an aspect, and you can see it inherits from the record metadata type there. Everything uh, in the content model is defined with a RMA prefix uh, domain. So here's a custom type that I implemented. It's the first one up at the top here. I made one called um, employee record, which was actually that um, definition that we just saw on the previous page. And so if you do that, you bootstrap it, it'll show up automatically in the, uh, in the, uh, the file page. All right, now, um, we talked some about multi-level file plans. So here's what a multi-level file plan looks like. So it used to be that you could only have one record category and then files uh, underneath that. So now you can have nested categories. And under categories, you can have uh, as many file folders and records as you want to. But you can 
change how that works um, throughout the system. You can have categories within categories, um, as many as you want to. And the disposition schedule, as we talked about, gets attached to a category. So if you have a nested disposition schedule like the one at the top, the one on the lower line there will inherit from the parent, while the one on the top line will change over. So basically, the farther the, down the chain you go, the one that's at the bottom wins. So, the, so it inherits down until it finds a new one. Um, so that's what I just talked about. Um, now, in terms of specifying a file plan, there's a couple of different ways to do it now. Well, one way is you can do it manually, which is the way that you used to have to do it, which is to uh, go in, you can define folders and categories in the, the file system, just like you would with uh, the regular uh, product. And then you can export that into an ACP file and you can import it back. But one of the cool features now is you can also specify this with um, an XML definition. And that's how the DOD example is um, set up. So once again, you can go into the uh, AMP file, find the DOD directory, and have a look at how that's defined. Now, right now, the loader is um, hard-coded to look for this particular thing. But in the 2.1 version, um, the loader will be able to load any type of file plan that you've defined using the, the XML. So um, specifying that looks like this. You um, have some tags, you know, that are fairly self-explanatory there. So I'm right here defining a, uh, a category that's called civilian files. And then you can have nested categories. This one actually has a nested category called employee performance file system. So um, that's how you specify the hierarchy. And what that looks like is this. It's, once again, pretty teeny tiny writing up here. I'm sorry. But um, so the, where the cursor is on the uh, file tree over there is uh, the civilian file. And then this is the nested plan. So all of these things are defined in the hierarchy record that uh, is in there. And that's the ones that we saw. So in terms of specifying a disposition schedule, then you can go in here. Um, you can, disposition schedules have steps, usually. Um, and so you can go in and you can add an, a list of steps into uh, a disposition schedule. And then you attach the disposition schedule to a point in the hierarchy, like a, a uh, uh, category. So this particular one shows up here so that if, if you look carefully at the XML on the previous page, um, that particular step right there is the one that's defined. So you can sort of see how that works. And once again, if you look at the, the one that's in the DOD example, you'll see how all of the whole uh, hierarchy that gets set up is, uh, is done. Um, additionally, you can set up a manual uh, disposition schedule if you click on this button right here. So there's a couple of different ways to do it. Well, so why is that cool? So um, it lets you model a uh, content structure in advance, basically. So you can go in, you can discuss it, you can tweak it, you can even try it out. Um, you can implement it and then erase it and do stuff to it. So um, it lets you do a couple of other interesting things as well. You can implement a standard, and we'll be publishing some other suggested um, organizations, I believe, using XML models like this. And it's actually an opportunity for uh, you guys that it means that um, you could define optimal structures, like, for, for instance, Dick Weisinger here, who wrote our RM book might want to go in and, and actually define a structure that he thinks is optimal. And uh, you could actually sell that to people. So um, with 2.1, as I mentioned, with the in-place stuff, only the record managers really need to understand what this structure is, since everybody else will just use the document management view. So you can kind of mess around with this behind the scenes. And so I think that's a, a fairly interesting feature. Um, 
let's see. As I said, you can try different versions of it, um, and you can uh, sell and uh, load different pre-designed structures. So, all right. Now, in uh, 2.0. There's uh, improved record searching, and there's a support for pre-configured safe searches. So you can configure a search by uh, setting up a, a uh, entry in a JSON data list that is attached to one of the uh, configuration objects inside of the uh, configuration files. So to do that, basically what you do is you just set up the search string so you can prototype it using the interactive search tool. Then copy the text and paste it into the JSON um, definition, and then it will show up every time that you run RM. So that definition is in the RM service context file. And the definition looks like this. So um, the name here is one called Vital Records Due for Review. And uh, so if we run the user interface, we'll actually see this show up in a couple of different places that I'll show you. And the actual search code is this right here in the other bold line. So you can make that as complex as you want for any different types of searches. You can also specify different search parameters here, and I'll show you what some of those things do as well. So the um, hierarchical view down in the uh, lower left-hand side there Pardon me. Um, that's where they show up, and you can execute searches from that location, for one thing, if you don't want to leave the, uh, the uh, file plan view. Or they also show up, um, here's another example that's got some more complicated searching stuff in it. They also show up here on the search page. So the, the previous example that had the uh, more extended search syntax, that's what is shown there. And the additional components that are shown at the bottom there, that's actually starting to check off some of the uh, other parameters for searching here. So um, you can do that with uh, any search, store it, and then it'll uh, show up automatically. Now, um, the new RM has a, a new thing called a capability. So in order to set up users in records management, basically what you do is you add users to Alfresco like you normally would. Um, you associate users to a role. So that's like setting them to a group definition in Alfresco. And then um, roles have these things called capabilities. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's a cool thing here in a sec. But the difference between version one and version two now is that capabilities are actually declared through spring definitions. And uh, so that lets you um, uh, actually change them and you can configure them some. So uh, here's a definition that's in the uh, product right now. So you can see it, once again, it has a name. Um, you can set up a list of pre and post conditions. And so this is where you can come in and you can change that a bit if you don't want it to work the way that it works out of the box. And you can override those. So where those show up in the user interface is here. Inside of the console, you can come in and you can say, I'd like to change how a particular role works. So what, what these really do is they're sort of a second way of uh, putting a constraint on what a user can do. The, um, so um, you have access control lists, and so that helps you to control who has access to content and who doesn't. But um, the capabilities actually give you control over verbs or actions in the system. So if you want to set up somebody that only has access to audit records or do audit functions, for example, that's what capabilities let you do. So that was a feature that we had in our old version one, but it's actually been completely re-engineered now. And uh, so it's, it's, once again, set up so it can be extended in the future. 
and uh, you have some control over how they're configured. So that's a pretty cool feature as well. It really gives you very fine game control. So. All right, in addition, the refactoring has set up everything so that um, it, RM now is more like a traditional service-based um, implementation like the rest of the content store. So um, there are services for a number of different things. So these are the core services here. Um, there's a service for the search. And so since the document management um, system itself doesn't actually have a save search capability, this can do that for you. So if you wanted to do some custom coding, you could actually put that capability into some of the base um, software. And actually, some of these um, capabilities may migrate into the base product anyway. So there's services to track capabilities and security. Um, actions and events, and then there's a few other mis miscellaneous things here. Here's the free service I was talking about if you're doing a legal search. All right, so let me do a quick demo. So um, here's an Alfresco instance that I'm running. I may be logged out by now. No, I'm still here. Um, so I've added RM to this instance, and so you still get a little um, dashlet when you install RM, and that installs RM for you. It creates the site and uh, can load the test data for you. If you do this um, item here, it will load the DoD test data for you. So let's uh, take a look at what's in the management console quickly. So there's some uh, audit configuration that you can do here. Um, this is the page that you can use to set up custom metadata. So if I wanted to add a, a uh, item on uh, records called uh, my value, I can do that. And then that will be added to everything that gets, uh, that piece of metadata will get added to everything that I define as a record. Um, here's the role page. So there's several different roles that are pre-configured for you here. And as you can see, there's um, some uh, people that have a lot of uh, different capabilities and some that don't have very many at all, like a normal user is only allowed to declare and view records. So I can define a new role here. If I wanted to define a role that only had audit capability, I could define a role called auditor, for example, and only add those capabilities that have to do with audit. Um, there's uh, uh, several other different things here. I don't think I'm going to go through most of those. Um, one thing that's interesting down here is here's some users that I have defined. Um, these will, this report actually shows you what types of uh, uh, rights they have to different pieces of content. So if I go to the records management site itself, um, it's a pretty simple interface. There's only a couple of menu items here. I can go to the file plan, which is just the file tree. And most of the functionality you'll see here is actually added in as um, sort of an adjunct to uh, what's already existing in the, the uh, document library. So come on. that took a while. So here's a folder where I can store records. We talked about how you can close a folder. This one's open, as shown by the unlock little uh, hoo-ha here. Um, so I can come in here um, eventually. And I can add a record. So that I can say I'd like to file a record. Um, once again, I can choose whether it's electronic or non-electronic. Here's my employee record that I added to this system. I'll add this one in as a <coughs> scanned record. And then I can select the file to upload. So I'll just add that file in right there. So 
So this comes in as an undeclared record. In order for me to use it, then I have to go through the process of declaring it. And the um, in-place de declaration process will actually let you queue those things so that the records managers can go in and uh, add those in, or declare them, rather. So you can declare it right there. Um, so if I go to the metadata for that record, um, we can see down here that there's some custom properties that uh, have to do with the scanning. So it has the resolution and that type of thing. So that's where the metadata um, comes into play for the record type. Um, if I back up here to here, let's see, back up to there. Um, if I go into the metadata for um, a uh, one of the folders or one of the uh, categories, then you can see that there's a, this is some of the metadata that was defined in the XML. So um, that's pretty straightforward. Once again, the save searches are down here. So I can execute, here's the one that we looked at, the vital records due for review. Um, that right now doesn't find anything, but it actually executed that search without leaving the page here. So that's a cool feature. And I can go over to the record search page here. Oh, well. um, and so I can either execute a save search here if I want to. This will load the uh, form automatically for me. So there's the uh, syntax for that search. If I want to filter that search with some additional data, I can tell it um, which uh, fields I'd like to have it filtered with and uh, some of the other uh, types of metadata that uh, it should look for there. And I can also um, define a new search. And there's a sort of an interactive builder tool to help you do that. So that's a, that's a quick demo. It looks a lot like um, the uh, older version of uh, RM, but uh, it's got some cool features built in under the covers there. So um, in conclusion, um, it's significantly more customizable and configurable. Um, Definitely use the DoD implementation as an example of what to do. And uh, we're writing a developer's guide that'll have a lot of this stuff documented so that uh, it'll have some examples and that type of thing that you can uh, use to actually do better customization. So, because All right, so any questions? Uh-huh. Well, so Share doesn't actually have the ability to save searches very well right now. Um, that capability actually lets you interactive, so you can interactively define one, save it, or you can predefine one in the configuration file, and that also saves it in a different way. Well, yeah, there's a dashlet that does it, yeah. So that's, it's, kind of built into RM, whereas it's not really built into share. Oh, well, it's, it saves the search criteria, I guess, is the way to say that. So, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Anything you'd like to add? <laughs> all right. All right, well, that's, uh, oh, uh, Okay. Um, I may have missed it, but how can I ensure it? What I'd like to see is a way for, say, if it's something in a folder, and that basically triggers, you know, that's an event. If it's something in a folder, that's an event. And it triggers an action and it fires a process that declares that as a record, the correct record, based on the file. 
cloud plan or whatever. So it, it's sort of done automatically. Right? Did I miss something? Or yeah, that's, that's what the in-place thing will do. So the question is, is there a way to make sure that records get filed correctly? Automatic. And automatically, yeah. So the, what will happen in 2.1 with the in-place um, records management is the, um, would, will a user actually still declare the record or? Okay. What's the time frame for 2.1? 2.1 will be early next year, I'm guessing, um, mm -hmm. just after the uh, end of the process. So, maybe in the past. So, that's, again, what we'll be doing next year. So, maybe slip through the front door. So, one more question, then we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, I have some problems with. You could, there is a way to do that programmatically. You could definitely write a little program to do that. Um, uh, there's not really a, an interactive way to do that, right? All right, well, uh, thanks very much for coming, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.